Well, it was the winter of 1567 when a Dutch Protestant named Dirk Willem Zoon was running for his life. King Philip II of Spain was, was reigning over much of Europe at that time, and he appointed his fearsome general, General Ferdinando Alvarez de Toledo, hailed by Spanish historians to be the greatest general of his time, while the rest of Europe considered him a butcher and a criminal for his brutal and ruthless campaigns, often slaughtering whole villages, uh, women, children. And this General Fernando was a devout Catholic and was appointed governor over the low countries with the task to subdue the uprising of Protestant rebels. And during the reign of terror, he set up uh, the Council of Troubles, soon nicknamed the Council of Blood for its merciless prosecution of Protestant heretical rebels. And Dirk was condemned by this council, but he managed to escape, and he was running for his life. A single officer of the court pursued him, a soldier, who was pursuing him knowing that his own life depended on catching Dirk and bringing him back for justice. And it happened that Dirk came to a, a frozen lake it was early the year, and of course that's northern hemisphere, so that's winter, and, and the, the ice that normally covers the lake was starting to become quite unstable. And he had no option but to risk crossing this lake, and so he ran out onto the lake, and the ice cracked and shook as he ran and ran, and he reckoned probably that death falling into this icy grave would be better than what awaits him if he was caught, tortured, and finally executed. And he was just about to step onto dry land when suddenly he heard a cry out behind him. And his pursuer, the soldier, was running and he fell through the ice and he just saw his face contorted and, and the horror as the cold water surrounded his body. And there was no one to help but Dirk Willem Zoon, the condemned fugitive. What must he do? What will you do? when you faced in that situation. Use your opportunity to get away. Well, Dirk Willem Zoon, with the love of Christ burning in his heart, stopped and at great risk to his own life, made his way back over the ice and rescued his pursuer from a certain icy, watery grave. Dirk loved his enemies. Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And of course, these are words that we find in, in Matthew, Matthew 5. And please turn there if you're not there already. Uh, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus was teaching on, on kingdom righteousness and was bringing correction to what the scribes have been teaching, the scribes and the Pharisees, and their teaching have become more and less. More because they were adding laws and stipulations to every commandment God g gave so that they would, by every minute detail, be able to obey that. And so they were actually making, enlarging the, the, the law, and yet they made it less because in doing so, they lowered the standard of God's righteousness. And Jesus came and he was teaching them that he was the one who fulfilled all uh, righteousness, that he is the one who fulfilled, who came to fulfill the, the law and the prophets. And uh, then proceeded to say that unless the kingdom, uh, uh, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven have a righteousness that surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, that they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he started teaching about the kingdom righteousness and, and used uh, six examples of what they have been taught, but which was inferior to what God's standards were or are. And so... Let's turn there to 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, and this is the sixth correction that Jesus was bringing. And he says that, You have heard it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray before we dive into this text. Father, we, we come to you, Lord, in need of your um, illumination. Through your Spirit, Lord, illumine our minds, our hearts, Lord, to, to hear your words and receive them by faith so that we would examine our lives in light of it. Lord, that your Spirit would bring conviction on the areas that do not resemble what we hear so that we may confess that and turn away from that and turn to you and cling to you, Lord. Help us now, Lord, as we study this text in Jesus' name. Amen. And so what Jesus was saying in this section was that really kingdom righteousness, when it comes to kingdom righteousness, love is its fulfillment. Jesus had been saying that about murder, about adultery, about divorce, about oaths, about personal rights. All of that is fulfilled through love. A holy love, a love that is defined by God and by His Word. A love that surpasses that of what the scribes and the Pharisees were, were teaching. And we saw last week that we, for us to walk in a holy love, we need to love in truth. And today we'll look at love in practice. And love in truth really means we need to love as God instructed us to love, not as the Pharisees have. The Pharisees have become unfaithful to God's word in this area. They have left certain parts out. We saw last time they have left out the little word as yourself, or the couple of words as yourself in loving your neighbor. Then we also saw that they redefined what neighbor means. And ultimately it was only those who were within their own group. And then we also saw that they added to God's word and that they taught that it was okay for you to hate your enemy, something that the Bible never allows. And all their teaching resulted in a righteousness that was more but less. More rules but less righteousness. And so Jesus was teaching that the kingdom righteousness is governed by love, by, by a holy love. Because a holy love legislates for, for everything, yet stipulates nothing. As soon as you add stipulations to the, what God requires, then you actually lessen what God requires. Because now I say, I don't need to love because it's not stipulated, it's not written down for me. And so a holy love is, is all-inclusive. And the standard is very high. We need to love as we love ourselves. And so love legislates for everything. It, it, it covers every aspect of your life, yet without stipulating the minute detail. And so it's very comprehensive. It's very broad. It's very deep. It's very wide. It's very high. And yet it does not stipulate the particulars. And so when it comes to love in practice, we'll see that love in practice means that we need to love uh, intently, love indiscriminately, love incomparably, and love impeccably. And my need for alliteration is <laughs> incurable, it seems. <laughs> but verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
But I say to you, Jesus was very authoritative when he preached. He was not relying on rabbis and their interpretations of ages past. He was saying, I, me, Jesus Christ is saying this to you. Very emphatic, very authoritative. He says, love not as you have been taught to love, but love as I tell you to love. Love intently, love purposefully, love deliberately, love obediently. Cultivate this disposition of love. Make this your default response to life, is that you would respond in, in love. And so he says here, love your enemies. And we saw last week that it's not a new commandment. Uh, we've seen that the Old Testament taught that uh, we need to care for your enemy's prop, uh, property. Uh, but it was never put so, quite so bluntly, quite so directly as when Jesus stated here. And this, this was a hard commandment to hear for those because in those days they lived in very difficult times. <laughs> Very, very dangerous times. They were living under Roman occupation and they hated the Romans. And here they saw Roman, Rome as their enemy. And here Jesus says, love these enemies. That's hard. It was hard for them. And we saw that there were divisions within the, the religious groups, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Zealots and the Essenes. They were all sort of... Uh, almost against each other, vying for, for their prominence in society. And so there's divisions between even the religious groups made it hard for them to love others within, uh, within uh, other groups. And then, of course, there was the disgust with the degenerate, the, the depraved, those who were immoral, irreligious, those who were willfully ignorant, who ignored God. They, although they are part of the nation of Israel, they lived as if they did not know God. And I thought, well, you know, it's much like today. Uh, we, we live under certain similar circumstances. Listen, we live in very, where, where, where differences in politics and ideology has become very dark and very dangerous. Uh, opponents viciously attack one another with seemingly very little restraint in, in their wording and in their, their hatred towards one another. Peaceful protest are seemingly not enough to make one's point. It needs to be violent. There needs to be threats of violence and actual violence, and that's becoming more the norm than the exception of protests. So we live in, we live in dangerous times. Also, divisions in religion make it difficult to love. I mean, we have tensions between Christians and Islam and Hinduism and others. Both historic and present atrocities fuel that hatred that we feel towards those of other faiths. It's hard to love the Muslim when you know that according to their teaching, they need to destroy you. The same goes for the, Mus for the Hindus. But it's not only interfaith hostilities, it's intrafaith hostilities, where different denominations, different groups within the broad, um, under the broader umbrella of Christendom, uh, we have the Roman Catholics who hates the Protestants, who hates the Orthodox, and vice versa. Interdenominational divisions all gang up against us living out this commandment, making it hard for us to love others. And then, of course, there's the depraved, the degenerate, the immoral, those who love to flaunt their sin and now insist on us celebrating with them in their sin. And it becomes almost unbearable. And the aggressive, intimidating tactics makes it hard for us to love them as Jesus commands us to love them. We have, uh, Heath has a friend Josh Williams, who is now the pastor of a church in, in Newquay, England, um, Newquay Baptist Church. And uh, he just voiced his agreement with God's word that homosexuality is a sin. And they have been just attacked from all sides, threatened to burn the church down and a whole host of other things. So please remember them in your prayers. 
And yet they have been faithful, from what I can tell, that to love their enemies. They desire their salvation. And it's that verse in Matthew 24, 12, really uh, becomes more and more relevant to us each day when it says, although this speaks to, to more towards the end times, I believe, it says, because of lawlessness is increased, the love of most people will grow cold. When people act against you, sinning against you, it is hard for you to return the evil that they do with love. But this is what Jesus commands. And of course, this is not a, the love that we're talking here about is, is agape love or agapao love, which is the verb form, which is really what the, that uh, 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 word most accurately describes. It's not just a disposition, a feeling, it's an action. And it's not necessarily a, uh, that I, we need to like our enemies. Thank God he didn't, uh, God didn't command us to like our enemies. Because that would be far, well, this is hard enough. Uh, but we are to love them. We are to look out for their best interest. If they are in need, we need to care for them. That is hard enough. But that is the love that Dirk Willem Zoon showed his pursuer when he stopped and help the man who was chasing him to execute him. That is the love that Joseph so showed his brothers after they've sold him into slavery. But really, it's a death sentence in those days. And when he finally uh, saw them again, he did not repay them evil with evil, but he repaid kindness to them for the evil that they have done to him. This is the, the love that Jesus had for those he came to save, and yet they rejected him. This is the love that God the Father showed to every sinner, like you and me, who are helpless and hostile to God in our sin. And he acted with amazing grace and great compassion to send Christ for us to be saved. And so to love your enemies, to practice this love intentionally. We need to love intently. We need to choose love as our default response. Remember, we're not asking you to like the person. We're asking you to act by helping the very one that may be pursuing you or hurting you or harming you. We need to be characterized by it. Reminds me of a story of, of uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, back in 1545, when King Henry VIII revealed to him that two of his friends were conspiring against him to get him accused of heresy so that he could be executed and removed from his position. And so King Henry gave him the letters that these friends wrote to him to implicate Archbishop Cranmer. And so he invited his friends over, and as they were walking in the garden, he asked them, what do you think should be done to someone who would connive and, 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 and plan and plot against a friend to, to, for their own purposes and their own um, advancement. And they wholeheartedly, such a person can, deserves to die. They need to be executed. They need, death is, is the penalty. On which Thomas Kramer revealed the letters to them that they are the ones that have condemned themselves. And of course, they were pleading for mercy that he would be forgiven, and Cranmer merely told them to ask forgiveness from God. Apparently, Cranmer had such a reputation that anyone among his friends that, that it was said, they, they came up with a little saying that if, if anyone seeks to harm him or hurt him, it's like making him a friend for life. That is how he would respond. He would, he would, his character was such that those who seek to harm him, he would respond in love. And so we are called to love intently, deliberately, purposefully, obediently, because the Lord commands us to do so. 
And we need to pray for our persecutors. Pray for those who follow after you, who pursue you, who harass you. And there's probably little difference between an enemy and a, and a, and a persecutor. The enemy may be, may be passive at times, that they, they have a, a hostile disposition towards you, but are not actively uh, engaged in that, where a persecutor is actively seeking to hurt you and to harm you. They're seeking your demise. They're seeking your downfall. They would attack you. They would plot against you. And Jesus said, pray for them. Intercede for them with a loving intercession. This is not calling down precatory psalms or precatory prayers upon them that God would judge them and, and remove their teeth and all of the stuff that we read in the psalms and knock their teeth out of their mouths and, and things like that. No, this is a prayer of love, a prayer, Lord, help them. And sometimes persecution is from outside of the church, and often it is from inside the church. And we need to pray that God's kindness be upon those so that that would lead them to repentance, Romans 2.14 tells us. We should pray that God would increase their understanding, the understanding of His will, so that they would understand His plans and purposes. As Colossians 1, 9 and 10 tells us, we should pray for their deliverance from the bonds of Satan who has ensnared them to do His will instead of God's will. 2 Timothy 2, 26. And most of all, we need to pray for their forgiveness. <laughs> and in this, Jesus is our supreme example. We read in Luke 23, verse 34, that Jesus, while hanging on the cross, having been betrayed by Judas, having been deserted by his disciples, having been denied by Peter, having been damned by the religious leaders, having been disowned by his own people, having been beaten and bruised, ridiculed, humiliated, mocked, with nail piercing his hands and his feet, with soldiers squabbling over his clothes, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Jesus is our example. And before you conclude, well, that was Jesus, man. Nobody, nobody can do this. No one but Jesus could have done this. And we seem to dismiss this requirement of ourselves. Remember that you, if you are in Christ, that you have been justified. And if you've been justified, then the love of God has been poured into your heart through the Spirit who has given you. You have God's love in your heart if you have the Spirit of God in you. You can do that. And Stephen, the first martyr, is evidence of that. Here Stephen was a, was a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit and was recognized for that through his loving service of others. And he was falsely accused and brought before the Sanhedrin. And in the midst of all his, his persecutors, he proclaimed the gospel message that infuriated them gnashing their teeth against him, stopping their ears. They don't want to hear the convicting words that he spoke. And they dragged him out and they stoned him. And as the stones were raining down on Stephen, he prayed, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Lord, forgive them, in other words. And it's my prayer that the Lord... The love of Christ would so control us. The love of God would so fill us that we would love like this. Love our enemies. That the Lord would help us to love them, that we would care for them when they are in need. That we would pray for our persecutors. Pray that God's kindness would fall upon them so that they would be led to repentance. 
And we, I pray that we would do this when our enemy is far away, when, 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 when our persecutors are faceless and, 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 and far off, unknown to us and unrelated to us. But also that the Lord especially would help us when our enemies and our persecutors are those who are near and dear to us. Perhaps family, perhaps friends, even perhaps fellow believers who may have turned against us. That we would be like Jesus, that when we are reviled, that we would not revile in turn. And while we, are, while we suffer at their hands, that we will not threaten, not pray for their demise, but pray for their salvation, pray for God's kindness to them, God's kindness that would lead them to repentance. And so we need to love intently, obediently, loving our enemies, praying for our persecutors. And that this love would be indiscriminate, that we should love indiscriminately. Verse 45, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. To love indiscriminately reveals your parentage, your lineage. There are essentially only two kinds of people in this world, two kinds of spiritual families, children of two kinds of spiritual fathers. On the one hand, you have those who are of the world, those who are children of the devil, who have their minds set on the things of the flesh, who loves the world and the things of this world, who has Satan as their father, who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning, who are dead in their trespasses, who follow the way of the prince of the power of the air, who are sons of disobedience and by nature children of wrath, those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, those who are condemned because of their rebellion against God. All of mankind are born to that family, that spiritual lineage, because of the inherent sin in our hearts. We are enslaved to this wicked and evil spiritual father and therefore cannot love in this way. We would always love selfishly when Satan is our father. But by God's grace, there is another family born to another spiritual father. Those who have been born again, to, born from above, John tells us, to a living hope. Those who by grace through faith have been saved and been reconciled to their heavenly father. Those whom he foreknew whom he predestined, whom he called, whom he justified, and whom he glorified. Those who are his adopted ones, made heirs with God and fellow heirs with Christ. Those who have been drawn, regenerated, converted, baptized, empowered, filled and sealed by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They are the ones who now walk by the Spirit and set their mind on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father who keeps seeking the things above and not the things of this world. They are called sons and daughters of God. They have been given a new heart. They have been made a new creation. They, have been, they are being conformed into the image of the one who redeemed them, Jesus Christ. And only those from this spiritual family have God as their heavenly Father and therefore are sons and daughters of God. And it's only they that can begin to love as the Father loves, as Christ commands us here indiscriminately. For he makes his son to 
to ri arise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. I, I just love the way the Lord said this. The Father makes His Son to shine. It's not the Son. It, he, it belongs to Him. He created it. And He, he, he makes it shine on, 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 on everyone indiscriminately, whether you are good or bad, righteous or unrighteous. And he sends his reign on both the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous, the good and the evil. He loved, his care is indiscriminate. And that's a testimony to God's agape love, that he would send sunshine and rain to those who do not acknowledge them as their maker, who lives lives in defiance and open rebellion to him. He blesses his enemies with goodness and kindness. He restrains his wrath and judgment so that delaying really his coming wrath so that no one would perish, but all come to repentance. And God's love is seen in his providential care of his creation. Theologians call that common grace. And God's common grace is indiscriminate. He cares for all his creatures. Good and evil. And our Heavenly Father lavishes goodness upon all mankind. And when we love like our Heavenly Father... How does he love? He gives good gifts in return for rebellious defiance. He gives kindness in return for hostility. He gives blessing in return for cursing. And he keeps doing that every day of those lives. It says, then all will know that we are sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father if we love like that. If we respond to rebellion, hostility, cursing, persecution in the way that God responds. So doing what is right in the kingdom, kingdom righteousness means we live by holy love, by God's love. We need to love intently because Jesus commands us and we need to love indiscriminately because that's how our Heavenly Father loves. And we need to love incomparably. Verse 46, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You see, righteous love, kingdom love, God's love is a, is a holy love, incomparable with the love of the world. And it's easy to repay kindness with kindness. I mean, everybody does that. It's easy to greet those who greet you. It's very hard to repay kindness for a wrong suffered. And it's been said that to love those you like is ordinary. To love those who are like you is narcissistic. To love those who are unlike you is extraordinary. But to, like, to love those who dislike you, that is revolutionary. And that's what we are called to. And Jesus used two rhetorical questions here to show that the love of the kingdom of heaven far exceeds the love that we see in the world. And these two questions, well, with these two questions, Jesus just blew the, the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees on love completely out of the water. Remember, they said that you essentially only love those that's within your own group. They left out the love as yourself, your neighbor. They redefined neighbor, and they say it's okay to hate your enemies. But Jesus pointed out that if you love like that, then you are no different 
than the world. You are no different than a tax collector or a Gentile. That must have stung their religious sensibilities a little bit. Because you know that tax collectors, oh, I think it's fair to say that tax collectors are not popular in any culture at any time. But they were specifically despised in Jesus' day because they were seen as collaborators with the Roman Empire. The way the Romans uh, 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 gathered taxes is they would levy a tax on a certain region and then they would appoint people to collect that tax. But what happened was the people did not know the amount that was levied on that region. And so the tax collectors would just do as much as they can, and whatever they could collect, more than what was levied was theirs to keep. And so they were wealthy, but despised, because they knew that they, that the people knew that they were uh, selfish, wicked. And so really in the Jews' days of that time, there was no one more wicked and despised than a tax collector. And Jesus was pointing out that even a tax collector... The most despised and wicked people you know respond with love when they are shown love. And if they do it, then, then anyone would. So how can you expect God to acknowledge that your love is a different kind of love, a holy love? How should God recognize your love as superior? Or why should he reward you, as in give you credit Recognize that, that, that you are like him, that you are different when your love is actually no different than that of a tax collector. So, no, the kingdom of heaven should be marked by a holy love, a love that is different, elevated, superior, unique, otherworldly. Everybody else has the capacity to return a kindness with a kindness. But it's the children of their heavenly Father and they alone who would have the capacity to love as the Lord commands and to love as the Father shows. But please, please turn to, to Romans 12, verse 9. Here in Romans 12, we are reminded of what a life uh, of those who have received the mercies of God um, and who's been transformed by the renewal of their minds should look like. And we read in Romans, Romans 12, verse 9, Let love be genuine. Let it be sincere. Love not just because others have loved you. Love with the love that God has placed in your heart. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Keep doing good even while you may shudder at the evil committed by others. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Pray for those who are persecuting you. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Don't, don't, don't use this as, as that lex talionis, uh, the, I, I will repay you for what I've received. And, and so we had them over for a meal. We showed them hospitality, but they have not returned the, the favor for us, so we're not going to ask them out again to come to us. That's not the love that should mark the Christian. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Pray God will bless them with his kindness when they are actually persecuting you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Show true compassion. Live in harmony with one another, verse 16. Let go of your personal rights. Remember that? We ought to take care of that. We need to remember what Jesus says. If one slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the others. If they sue you for your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. Go the extra mile. All these attitudes will go a long way in maintaining harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Don't only love your own group, your own, of your own social standing. Be indiscriminate, even in the church. Love everyone. Verse 
And these actions and attitudes must be motivated by love, a holy love, a different love that far exceeds the love of the world, a love that only God can pour into our hearts. So keep your finger here in, in, in uh, Romans 12, and I'm just going to return briefly to Matthew 5, where Jesus continues and says, And if you greet only those brothers, only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? And Jesus asks this really brilliantly penetrating question. He says, what makes you better? What are you doing more than others? You see, if the Jews and the Gentiles of those days would, would predominantly only greet those of their own brethren, their, their own nationality. And the scribes and the Pharisees were even more selective. They would only greet those who were really part of their group and perhaps maybe another religious man. And Jesus was asking me, if you do that, how are you different? How is your love better? What distinguishes you from others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? It's like a double ouch there. You can just imagine the, the scribes and the Pharisees squirming as they hear these words. You see, for the Jew, a greeting, and for those who were conscious of it, was really a prayer. They would use the word shalom, peace. In essence, God's peace be with you. That's how you would greet one another. But I don't believe that is what Jesus had in mind here. He did not have the shalom greeting in mind here because he compared their greeting with the greeting of the Gentiles. Now, in the Gentile world, Greeting was often nothing more than a simple acknowledgement. I see you. I, 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 I'm glad to see you. I, I acknowledge your existence. I acknowledge your presence. And so it was really a common courtesy, an act of civil decency to greet someone. And I believe Jesus had this in mind, this sense in mind, just sort of using a, a common greeting as, as really the, the lowest example of agape love. Hello, I see you. I acknowledge you. And so Jesus said to his listeners, if you only greet those of your own, those of your own group, then your love is no different than the Gentiles because they do the same. They greet their Friends, they greet others. I acknowledge your presence, your existence. And so they are no different than a Gentile, than an unbeliever. So how does that, how does your greeting distinguish you from the Gentiles? How is your love different how is it a kingdom of heaven kind of love, an otherworldly love? And you sometimes see that in church where someone, you arrive at church and I'm going to use names, I hope I don't step on anyone's feet, but Bob and Barbara. Is there a Bob and Barbara here? <laughs> All right. We, we arrived at church and Bob and Barbara walked right past us. They saw us, but they didn't even greet us. They said, well, okay, two can play this game, so next time I'm just not going to greet you. That is not love. That is not agape love. When, 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 because that is the Pharisee in you. Say, so, okay, I, if, if you not be part of my group, then I'm not going to greet you. You should listen to the Spirit of God in you that would spur you on, that even though you are spurned and shunned, say, Shalom, brother, sister. God's richest peace and blessing be upon you. How can I make your life better? How can I serve you? Back in Romans 12, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. 
If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In short, be like your heavenly Father, who loves indiscriminately. Listen to the Lord, your Savior. Love intently. Love incomparably. And lastly, verse 48, love impeccably. You, therefore, must be perfect as your Father, your Heavenly Father, is perfect. Jesus ends his teaching on, on love with one final commandment. Be perfect. Sons of a heavenly father, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Perfection is the standard. To love perfectly is to love intently, to love indiscriminately, and to love incomparably. And so the immediate context of this talks about love. Be perfect in the love that you show as God is perfect in the love that he shows. But also in the wider context is be perfect in righteousness. Perfect righteousness comes about by loving one another perfectly. And see, the scribes and the Pharisees based their righteousness on a much lower standard. They based their righteousness on a conformity to external, to the externals, to the letter of the law. Each and every stipulation and extrapolation, if it's not written down, I don't need to do that. However, love, as I said, legislates for everything, but stipulating nothing. It covers every conceivable aspect of life. Love is the fulfillment of kingdom righteousness. And what Jesus said is that God requires conformity with himself in this regard. That is the standard. That is the command. And if you're like me, I would say, woe is me. I am undone. Who, who, who can do this? Who can live and love as God loves us? But elsewhere, Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And so what God requires, God also provides. If you turn to Romans 8 for a moment, Romans 8 verse 3, the righteousness God requires, God provides for those who love him. And so Romans 3, sorry, Romans 8 verse 3 reads, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Remember what Jesus said, that he came to fulfill all the law and the prophets, fulfill all righteousness, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. 
But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And so perhaps there may be here someone that, that realized that their life has been lived really to satisfy the external conformity to the law. Perhaps you recognize that your mind is still set on the things of the flesh. You recognize that you are not submitting to God's will, His ways, His desires, His attitudes, His actions. What you are doing is not pleasing to God. You recognize that the Spirit of God is not in you, that you are not led by the Spirit of God. If that is true, then God says to you this morning that you are not a son or a daughter of His. You still belong to the spiritual family of Satan, spiritually dead eternally condemned and you would be void of the love of God in your heart but there is hope there is good news for the love of God and his kindness has led you to this place if that is you that you should come and repent that you should acknowledge and confess your sins and turn away from them and put your faith and your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, for perfect righteousness, for reconciliation with God the Father. And God promises if you do that, what you lack, what you lack in righteousness, what you lack in love, He will give you. He will give you Christ's righteousness. The love of Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith. His perfect righteousness is what you will need to be reconciled with Him. And if you have come to faith, if the Spirit of God indeed dwells in your heart and, and testify to your spirit that you are a son and a daughter of God, but you realize that you have grieved God's Spirit and you have not loved as your Heavenly Father loves, then I would urge you to confess it, to bring it to the Lord. Realize that it is sin. Confess it as sin and receive the forgiveness that Christ bought for us on the cross. And then thank the Lord, the Father, for Jesus Christ, who fulfilled all righteousness, who lived in perfect love. And draw near to God. Resolve to walk by the Spirit, to be influenced, allow the Spirit of God to influence your thinking, your actions, your decisions. And look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of, of your faith. We need to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And that has been granted you in Christ. Now we need to daily seek to live that out and become more and more what we have been given, what we have been declared in Christ. And we will receive the full reality of that when we see him face to face. 
a righteousness that surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, a righteousness that is attained through love, the love of God, the love for others, is only received by faith in Christ Jesus, who is the perfect love and righteousness of God. Love intently, love indiscriminately, love incomparably, love impeccably. How do we do that? We cling to Christ. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who loves, that you are a loving Father. Lord, and that I pray that that and that alone would totally blow our minds. That there is a being who loves in such a way that even though most in the world defy you, most of the world rebel against you, most of the world do not acknowledge you, they are hostile to you, and yet you show love to them by giving them the very breath with which they use to curse you, giving them the very life they use to rebel against you. And more than that, that you send your only Son, Christ Jesus, to die for sinners. And through faith, they may become children of God. They may be forgiven. They may be reconciled. They may be given new hearts, hearts that are filled with the love of God. Oh, Father, help us to love as you love. In Jesus' name, amen.